situation where Palestinians, again, are being called on to, to negotiate for their freedom. And we hear that coming up again about the two-state solution, the two-state solution. I, I would say we don't want to get into that. We want to focus on a solution that will guarantee the equal rights of everyone. And this attempt to do a two-state solution for over 30 years has failed. So why don't we work on a solution where every, we're working on respecting the dignity and the equality of every single person. And right now, it is the Palestinians who have no freedom are being deliberately denied the right to dignity. Although I would say that Palestinians are, you know, show the world dignity because everything that they are going through and they have not lost their humanity. They have not lost their ability to, to love and to love life, despite the fact that life has not shown them any kind of, of kindness. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Welcome to this, the next series of webinars in the Stones Cry Out virtual delegation. It's building on our in-person delegation to Palestine this past February and March. These webinars um, are, are designed to inform and empower our advocacy this coming September 23rd to 25th as we gather in Washington, D.C. for meetings, direct actions, demonstrations, and other important gatherings. You'll notice, uh, for example, I was just in touch with Josh Paul, who resigned from the State Department um, uh, earlier this year in protest of the Biden administration policies toward Palestine and Israel, and he'll be uh, one of our speakers. So we urge you to spread the word widely and join us in Washington, D.C., September 23rd to 25th. Our next uh, webinar is next week when I interview political analyst and activist Josh Rubner. Many of you know Josh is just finishing his PhD under Ilan Pape at University of Exeter. So join us next Wednesday, August 21st, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Finally, I want to say thanks to my partners, Kairos USA's Mark Braverman and Doug and Doug Thorpe from the Episcopal Bishops Committee in the uh, uh, in the uh, Diocese of Tacoma uh, of Olympia. I'm sorry, and all the sponsoring organizations listed here. We're delighted today, uh, really, to welcome our friend, Palestinian American lawyer, co-founder of the International Solidarity Movement an organizer of the Gaza Freedom Flotilla, a member of the Palestinian Lawyers Guild, and so much more, Hawaida Arif. Hawaida, uh, welcome. Lots to talk about today. It's good to be with you, Michael. Thank you. And to everyone who's tuning in, thank you for being here. I want to jump right in, Hawaida. Uh, uh, we're on day 312, 10 plus months of Israeli, uh, Israel's genocidal assault uh, uh, on Gaza. But I've been saying this from the beginning and I've asked this to every one of our speakers. This is more than a war on Gaza or Palestine. It's uh, a war on Palestinian history, tradition, culture. It's a war against the very idea of Palestine itself, an attempt to erase Palestine from human memory. It's the very definition of genocide. Uh, your reaction? Well, I think that's absolutely true. And what, we, what we've what we had until now in, in this kind of awakening amongst a lot more people is this notion that we have a conflict um, over territory, uh, a religious conflict, and it's been taken since at least since the Oslo peace process but even before where it's it's couched in this idea of these two parties negotiating an end to this conflict and why that never worked is because Israel from its inception it's not me saying it it's it, the founders of the state of Israel saying it it was founded as a colonial project 
and especially in settler colonialism, the goal of settler colonialism is to replace the indigenous population. You replace them by driving them off the land, um, by killing them. Uh, and here, actually, when what we're seeing now is an, an acceleration of that killing on top of the way that you're, uh, you're, uh... You're, you're freezing up on this, Hawaita. You're freezing. Absolutely true. Hawaita, you want to check your uh, connection? You're freezing up on us, and we're having trouble hearing you. Oh, no. My connection is good. Can All right, you hear good. me now? We can hear you now. Okay. I hope you heard what I said, so I won't repeat. Only to say that we have, or, or there has been a purposeful misleading previously in terms of what the nature of Israel in Palestine, in occupied Palestine has been. Of course, we're used to understanding that Israel was the victim and it was attacked by surrounding Arab countries and it just trying to stay uh, safe and ensure its security. Now we know or it has been exposed, of course, Palestinians have always been saying, but it's been exposed that Israel never really was never the victim. Israel is a settler colonial project and through the years has been working to replace the indigenous Palestinian population. And when we got into the peace process in 1993, and of course the United States was a big part of this, of trying to completely disregard international law where it comes to Israel and Palestine and a resolution uh, of the situation and turn it into a situation where uh, of just dialogue in order to come to an agreement uh, to, to settle the, what they say, conflict. That, of course, contributed to an understanding that it's just a dispute between two equal parties, if not Palestine and Palestinians being the aggressors and Israel the victim, and the stories that we're used to hearing about all of these concessions and these generous offers that were made for to Palestinians over the years, and the United States, of course, contributing to that, always taking Israel's side. It has been clear, no matter what Palestinians have offered, and before the talk of the two-state solution, Palestinians were working for and calling for one democratic state with all people, yeah. all people sure. living in there. Of course, it became then this two-state solution. And we saw that that was never able to be implemented because Israel continued its colonization of the land while it was supposedly trying to negotiate. And this was, for me, one of the most important things uh, of the International Court of Justice recent ruling on the legality of Israel's occupation. It just came out in July 19th last month. It, there were many important things in there, but one of the most important things for me was saying that Palestinian liberation or Palestinian right to self-determination is not contingent on Israel's diktats not contingent on a peace process. Palestinians have an inherent right to self-determination. And trying to couch that into Israel must agree on the contours of that is, is illegal. And Israel's situation of occupying the West Bank, Gaza, including East Jerusalem, is unlawful and must be be brought to an end as swiftly as possible. And all states have an obligation not to recognize that, uh, that unlawful situation, and also to enact, uh, and, and also not to facilitate it. So not to contribute to the continuation of this unlawful, uh, this unlawful situation. And we know that the United States has been uh, doing that. Again, the important part of that Again, many, many important parts, but one of the most important parts is erasing this notion that Palestinian freedom is contingent on Israel agreeing in some kind of peace process. Right. And every time right. international law is brought up to the, to the United States, we have the ICC, the ICJ, violations that are presented to 
you know, various and, and excessive U.S. administrations, we always hear that that's not helpful to the peace process. Well, Palestinian rights and the right to be free is not contingent on any peace process. Well, wait, as, as long as you brought it up, uh, let me ask you, you're, you're a, 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 a attorney, a human rights lawyer. You, you brought up the ICC and ICJ rulings. And of course, we activists uh, celebrate these legal victories, yet nothing changes on, on the ground. I mean, does I don't want to be cynical, but does international law matter anymore? Tell us why it matters. Tell us why these rulings matter and how we can help make them matter on the ground for the Palestinian people. Well, that's a great question and one that many people, certainly activists, have been asking these days. And actually, when was it? Back four, 16 years ago now, when I was teaching law in Jerusalem to Palestinian law students, and I was teaching international human rights and humanitarian law. And back then, my students said to me, this is nice, miss, but it doesn't apply to us. So it really doesn't matter. It looks nice on paper. And, you know, back then I had an answer, and, and it's similar now in that we have to understand law is not a savior, not a be all and end all. It is a tool that we use. It is a tool in our toolbox. And if you understand the development of international law, you know that it was developed by, you know, at a time where of, a world like colonialism and developed by colonial powers. And that extended to, you know, the, the post-World War II era, post the, the colonial decolonization era, it was thought to improve because now newly decolonized countries were having an input to becoming states and members of the, of the United Nations. But you had a structure put in that ensured that certain countries, the powerful nations, maintained really a uh, control of everything that's happening, anything consequential. And so you have the UN Security Council, which really is the only body that exists today to authorize uh, action in, in order to enforce peace or enforce the law. And there is a veto in there that the United States has been wielding in order to defend Israel. So does that make the international law irrelevant? No, uh, but but it is a tool for us to use. And knowing that in international law, you have international courts, but you don't have those courts don't have an enforcement mechanism. There is no world police, right? The, it comes back to the states to enforce. And what moves or what affects the state's politics for, for most, or, or no, let me not say for most, for some democratic, countries it is the people and yeah. therefore i say we need to use the law uh, use the law as a tool in our mobilizing but we have to move and change the streets to put the pressure on our governments to do the right thing to actually enforce the law and we are seeing now in the last couple of decades Palestinians resorting to international courts more than we have in the previous stages of our liberation struggle. And, and each time we do go to these the international courts, we win because it, it is what we've been saying. Israel has been violating international law, but now we have to take those rulings and try to get our states. And when we talk about the United States, the United States always talks about uh, the law and freedom and democracy and human rights. Well, here we have uh, the International Court of Justice. That is the ruling, the strongest ruling that we have to date of the legality of what Israel is doing. And we have to get our countries to respect them. But that comes back to what we're doing on the ground, what you're doing here, what everyone that's participating doing in educating. In educating and then using that education to pro to to pressure our policymakers. And we know having been doing this for a long time, it's not only educating our policymakers, right? Because we have a political system that unfortunately is run on money. And being in the process now, we know and hearing about uh, 
these last this last month or so how much the pro-Israel lobby is spending on unseating members of Congress who are critical of Israel. We know that unfortunately, and that it, it's there are other interests and in not just doing the right thing. But that does not mean that okay, we need to outraise and outspend them and and buy politicians. That's not what I'm saying at all. But we can all of that money that is raised and poured into political campaigns, it's all for the goal of getting votes. We can use ourselves, mobilize to get those votes. What the money is doing, we can do as people. But it takes work and it takes belief. And it is it is hard work, but it is work if we believe in, in what we're fighting for that I hope we are ready to do. So we must continue the education process. Our members of Congress must be hearing from us, but we also must be mobilized to help elect people that actually represent us. I'm going to come back to the uh, to the U.S. elections and American politics in a minute, uh, Hoeda, uh, because you have a particular perspective on that, having run for office yourself and experienced the mobilization against you. But I, I want to, before I do that, um, I want to ask you, I, I want to talk about Gaza's children, because you and I have had, we've interviewed about that in the past. You've spoken about that when you've been here. Save the Children talks about 18,000 children killed, and I know it's, I, I, I believe it's more than that now. 20,000 children orphaned, unaccompanied by parents or other adults. Another 21,000 children missing. The statistics, you know, are overwhelming. Overall deaths, I've seen anywhere between 100 and 180,000. I want you to talk about um, the human toll. Uh, we hear about the children. I, I, I mean, you and I have talked before about the children who live through this even, uh, the, the trauma that they bear, and, and they're becoming radicalized in themselves. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy for Israel. Um the bodily trauma, the brain injuries, death by suicide. I mean, talk about the human toll on the children, both in terms of the death, those who died, but and the impact on their families, but also those who survived. Yeah, it, it's, it's so a big difficult. question. Yeah, it, it is a big question, and it is almost incomprehensible. It's incomprehensible the magnitude of the death, destruction, and trauma that we are dealing with. I mean, months ago, we heard reports of five-year-old children wishing they were dead, with wanting, and, and I continue to see till today, children crying over their dead parents or brothers and sisters and saying that they wish they were with them. Why can't they go? And that is not only, I think, based on the trauma of losing such a loved one, but also the pain of being alive now in Gaza. I don't know if any one of us can really imagine over 10 months of not having housing, not having water, not having sanitation, constantly having to move largely on foot because you don't have fuel for cars or they've been destroyed. People are tired. There's no privacy. The basic things of just going to, to relieve yourself is a big ordeal, waiting in line for hundreds of people, and then what kind of conditions that in, and that's in addition to the elements when it gets cold, the rain, the heat now, being in, in the 90s in Gaza, the bodies under the rubble that are decomposing, the sewage that is in the streets, living in that, and that is not even counting, that is not even counting the bombs and the constant drones, the buzzing that never go away, that are probably I, will they ever go away in the heads of these children? So what does that do? I, I know my own children. My children are, are nine and 11. You, you, I know when the, the lights went out because there was a, a light, uh, lightning and thunder and how they got scared. And I'm just imagining that constant in Gaza on top of not having any one to reassure you. I mean, even if your parents are there, if you still have them, you can't reassure them. And many of them have their parents and they don't know what to do. And that's not even counting the starvation on top of that, the difficulty of finding food. So how the lasting impact of that, I don't know if anyone really knows, but I, I do know when I was in Gaza the last time, 
in 2009. It was right after Operation Cast Lead and Israel had destroyed a lot uh, of thousands and thousands of buildings, homes, schools, churches, mosques, businesses, then, and killed 1,400 Palestinians. And I went in with a delegation of lawyers from the National Lawyers Guild, all American lawyers. We were about nine of us. And hearing the stories, there's just traumatizing stories. And one of them being of these children who were taking refuge, I mean, in a house with their family. And that house was struck by an Israeli missile. And then the Israeli military prevented the Red Cross or Red Crescent from getting to the house to look for survivors. When they finally did on after the third day, it was the fourth day, got to the house, they found children there that had nothing to eat for three days and were surrounded by the bodies of their dead relatives. These children, I constantly think about what happened to them because after 2008, you had the bombing of 2012 and 2014 and 2018, the Great March of Return, again, another onslaught in 2021. And now we have this one. Many, chil all children really in Gaza that are of that age have known nothing but living in a perpetual state of war and, and want. That is outside of before Israel started this, the, the rates of malnutrition and poverty and unemployment in God, not being able to leave. Michael, you know, I don't know if, if some of the people tuning in know that before Operation Cast Lead, I was part of an initiative uh, that succeeded to bring boats to reach the people of Gaza by boat. We were challenged trying to break the siege and that effort continued. But after 2008, we weren't able to actually reach Gaza anymore. In 2008, I was able to reach Gaza five times by boat. And one of the most devastating things and the hardest things for me is we would try to have room on our boat to bring out a couple of people. We had a small boat, so we really didn't have a lot of room. But the number of people, and especially young people, especially students saying, please take me out because they had scholarships, they had one placement in foreign universities and Israel would not let them leave. So their whole future kind of tied to this small prison that is the size of Metro Detroit and they're trapped and see no future. But imagine having a scholarship and want a place in a prestigious university or any foreign university and not being able to get out. I would have students tell me, just, just take us halfway and then we'll swim the rest of the way, wanting to get out. And that was 2008, that was so much better than today. And all of these people stayed trapped, witnessed so many more onslaughts and are now being starved, diseased and, and mutilated and bombed to death and trying to call out to the world as they have been for decades, but even now, as we know by, by live streaming, their annihilation. And it seems like nobody cares. Well, it's not nobody. I actually have been trying to be careful about saying that because there is massive mobilization in the streets. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think that is felt. And I think that that's one of the most important reasons to keep that up because of people that is facing this, seeing that people care, whatever news, um, my, can, can get to them that people are trying to do something it it might seem small but it helps so it's not the people that don't care it is our government and it's our responsibility to move our government let me ask you uh, um um israel is um uh, uh, outdoing itself in trying to uh, draw the u.s into a larger regional war involving iran lebanon saudi arabia syria and more, I mean, assassinations in Lebanon without Lebanese consent. Uh, they, um, uh, uh, the assassination of Is Ismail uh, uh, Haniya in Iran. Uh, he was there. He was there as a negotiator. Uh, um, so, talk to us about Israel's trying to the the attempt to draw the U.S. into this larger regional uh, war. Yeah, that's what it looks like, right? Because Israel continues to attack its neighbors and, and cry victim, right? Um, and they know that 
they can do that for the most part because the United States has just been an uncritical supplier of uh, political support, uh, ensuring that Israel remains in, immune from any kind of accountability and sending shipments of weapons when Israel needs it. And we know yesterday we heard of last week it was 3.5 billion in additional financing to buy new weapons and yesterday a 20,000, a $20 billion deal was just approved. So no matter what they do, they know that the United States is not only standing behind them, but also with the rhetoric, with the rhetoric, giving them the, the green light to continue because the rhetoric has been uh, to blame the Palestinians. And, and we know that with, especially with the negotiations, the Biden administration always saying that the ball is in you know, Hamas's court when it's each time it's been Israel that has not been accepting the deal that was seemingly on the table. And then with assassinating Ismail Haniyeh, who was not part of the arm wing, and largely believed not to even have known about October 7th and been a pretty moderate negotiator. He was the top negotiator. And, you know, Israel assassinates the top negotiator, and yet there's no condemnation from the United States. We still hear about uh, we still hear about the need to to negotiate. No real criticism of of Israel, which again allows allows people to be uh, manipulated or to have this misinformation about what is actually happening. And so we know or have been hearing about Benjamin Netanyahu and his own personal reasons for wanting this to drag on. Uh, he doesn't care about the hostages. He doesn't care about hostage families. He doesn't care about uh, ruining Israel. He doesn't care about starting a regional or a world war. It's his own personal um, stakes that he is thinking about. And so continue, striking Lebanon, striking Iran in this, in this way is, as you said, this attempt to start a regional war and the United States as the obedient big brother enabler is sending, you know, massive uh, troops and armaments to the region and and making these declarations that they will defend Israel, they are behind Israel, when again, Israel is the aggressor in the region. Um, I, I think as frustrating as it is, I'm hoping that it has become clear to the world just what's happening and the statements made by the United States and just the other day we saw France, the UK, um, what was the third state that came out really uh, saying that Iran should not attack Israel. But doesn't Iran have a right to defend itself? The U sure. Israel violated its territorial sovereignty. Uh, Israel, Israel attacked, but no other country has the right to defend itself. And not that we want to see attacks or we want to see war, but just the rhetoric again and the impunity allows us to continue. But like I said, I think it is being uh, exposed and even even staunch defenders of Israel can't really do it anymore. And I'll give you one hopeful, semi-hopeful, I think, example. And maybe it's an example of what people can do in their own uh, communities. So I last weekend, I went to my Democratic, um, it was a, a county convention because we have the state convention coming up for the Democratic Party. So I went to my county convention and I submitted two resolutions, strongly worded resolutions, one about, you know, condemning the attacks on student protesters and, and standing in full support of the student protesters in Michigan and across the United States, and one uh, calling for an arms embargo on Israel and listing the facts and the, uh, and the genocide and stating that the American people do not want their uh, tax dollars going to fund genocide and killing children anywhere. And therefore, you know, the Michigan Democratic Party calls for an arms embargo on Israel and unanimously. And I am not I do not live in a progressive area. I my my district leans Trump and the Democrats in this area are are lukewarm, definitely not progressive, but overwhelmingly well, unanimously passed to uh, it was unanimously voted on to send this resolution up to the state. And next week is the state convention. And if this resolution 
is put before the state convention, we have a good chance of passing a resolution that says the Michigan Democratic Party calls for an embargo on, uh, an arms embargo on Israel. I, I raise that as something that's, you know, slightly a positive that we can do at the local level and maybe move up, but also in saying that my district here, the Democrats are in no way progressive and there are defenders of Israel, but even then, you can't really defend what Israel has been doing and everybody agreeing like, yeah, we need some kind of arms embargo on Israel. I'm glad you brought up U.S. politics because um, uh, just in our conversation via email uh, in the last couple of weeks, I know that that's something that you've really been heavily involved with and want to mm -hmm. talk about. You already talked about the impact of APAC money uh, in the elections. Uh, just to, as a reminder to our audience, more than... $15 million to defeat Jamal Bowman in New York, more than $8 million to defeat Cori Bush in Missouri. Fortunately, right, Ilhan, Ilhan Omar uh, won her primary yesterday. But um, uh, so the, the influence of APAC money, I mean, and, and really going after, focusing on members of Congress uh, over the issue of Israel. We know that President Biden has been absolutist in his support of Israel. I mean, he's called himself a Zionist. He's approved bypassing Congress, right? Again, uh, sending billions and tens of billions of dollars in arms to Israel. We also know the, Repu the, the position of the Republican nominee uh, for president. What can you tell us about the Democratic nominee Vice President uh, Kamala Harris and uh, the in, any influence of uh, APAC money uh, on on her voting. I mean, I think many of us have opinions, but maybe you have a particular insight. Well, I don't have any like insider information on the influence of um, you know particular influence of APAC money on her, but we know that a a APAC does round up millions and millions of dollars and gives to Democrat and Republicans and they've given to election deniers and you know women's rights deniers their apex criteria is only you know uh, how you view or how the member of Congress or the potential member of Congress views Israel and will they vote uh, with Israel no matter what kind of government Israel has vote to defend Israel no matter what that is apex line no other policy, domestic policy matters. But it's not only APAC, it is, of course, staunch defenders of Israel and Zionists that have long been in the administration as advisors. You know, we say we don't actually know how cognizant Biden is now, although he has previously said that, you know, he is a Zionist and that if there wasn't an Israel, we would have had to create one. But we also know who he surrounds himself with. And these are staunch Zionists. So who's actually calling the shots now? We don't know. We'll, we'll leave that to speculation. But Kamala Harris, you know, we've heard she shows a little bit more empathy. It might signal a change in her administration, but empathy is not going to get us anywhere. We need a, a clear change of policy. Okay, so she empathizes with the children who are being beheaded in Gaza. I mean, thank you. Uh, she's a little bit more empathetic than her predecessor. That wasn't a high bar, really. That was a very low bar. Uh, and again, Empathy without change in policy is not going to get us anywhere. And so what we have uh, uh, in terms of pressure tactics on the outside, as I hope people have noticed, you've had protests wherever policymakers go. And certainly Kamala Harris was in Michigan, was in Detroit just last week and also faced that. But you also have the uncommitted campaign that managed to win uh, seats to the Democratic National convention by encouraging people in the states where they had an option to vote uncommitted in the Democratic primary to do so. And, and with that strategy, about 730,000 people across the country voted uncommitted, and that won un uncommitted 30 delegates to the Democratic National Convention. I am an alternate delegate, so I will be there. Uh, my district actually didn't get any uncommitted delegates, unfortunately, as I told you, we were not a very progressive uh, district. But the strategy of uncommitted is to say, look, we 
would like to see, we would like to help you, Kamala. We would like to help this administration win, but our people and the people that we represent are not going to vote for you, are not going to get behind you without a clear change in policy towards Gaza, towards Palestine. At first it was ceasefire, now the demand is, is embargo, arms embargo on Israel. And the, the campaign is worried. The administration, even the Democrats, are worried, and there has been some... Um, there has been some communication. There is some outreach. There is, there is no firm indication that we're going to get an arms embargo. And we've heard people say that that's almost impossible. Maybe so, but we are. That's what we're calling for. That is what's needed. The uncommitted is is also pushing for other things at the Democratic National Convention, including having a doctor, a Palestinian uh, doctor, who was in Gaza, speak to all of the delegates. Um, it's not clear yet if we'll get that spot. Speak about what she saw, uh, but what we know is that the, you know, the Democratic Party and the Harris campaign is engaging. They uh, they feel the pressure, even though polls right now are saying that Harris is up in some of the key swing states, including Michigan. Everywhere that she's up is really still within the margin of error, and that could flip. And that depends on, of course, getting people out, and certainly. Uh, the the uncommitted Arab American, Muslim, Palestinian American, and and broader the youth and everyone else is is part of that, uh, and and I think it's it's been a good strategy, but it's one strategy, and continuing to call to continue to demand of the administration and of the campaign that we need an arms embargo while another team is negotiating uh, or trying to negotiate. Uh, it, it's all it's all needed and more. So, like I said, I don't have any inside information. I know the Democratic Party for for decades of people that have been in certain key spots and the big donors and the people in the administration uh, have been who are in key positions are Israel apologists. Zionist strong Zionist and we can only continue working to try to change that and working you know I, I've been more within the Democratic Party but actually most of my adult life I've been outside we need to mobilize inside and outside uh, I wouldn't say people on the Republican Party also uh, mobilize but then there's also the third party in this attempt also to uh, to, to try to break this duopoly that many people think are corrupt and doesn't really is, is corrupt and doesn't really yeah. work for us. So yeah. we have the Green Party that has really prioritized Gaza and Palestine in its platform. And that is really the number one issue for the Green Party. And I was just on the, in the phone with them last night about this very thing. Uh, all of that to say that we can't let up. We are making the people who have their uh, hands on the levers of power, we are making them listen. Uh, whether they will do the right thing is remains to be seen. I think we keep pushing. And in the end, if they don't do the right thing and they don't get our support, they have no one to blame but themselves. That is, I think, very important to, to hold on to. No one to blame but themselves if they end up losing because they refuse to take any action to stop the genocide and the slaughter of Palestinians. And just one thing I'll add on that. I know Kamala to, to uh, you know, to try to appeal to these protesters. We saw what she said in Michigan, right? She changed her tune a little bit in yeah. in Arizona yeah. and a little bit better. Like I'm listening, and then stated that she and Biden were working around the clock for a ceasefire. But just hours before. The United States had approved a $3.5 billion package, weapons package to right. Israel, just hours before right. that she stood there in front of thousands and thousands of people and said, we're working around the clock for a ceasefire. So again, her rhetoric is not stopping the killing. We need more than that. We, uh, about a month or so, we were one of the co-hosts of uh, a rally where we hosted uh, Jill Stein. Uh, to speak. And so uh, the Green Party, you're right. And, and her her candidacy is uh, an important one. Uh, I, I want to follow up. I don't have these here on my list of questions asked, but you raised both of these. And so uh, I'd like for you to address them. Part one and part two. Part one, um, you, you referenced, of course, you're in Michigan. 
and you said that Kamala was up by a smidgen, you know, she was, she was within the margin of error. Uh, you know, all our eyes are uh, on the swing states. So handicap Michigan for us. And then uh, number two, you said you're going to be in Chicago for the DNC uh, next week. Talk to us about the influence of Arab Americans and Palestinian Americans next week on the ground in Chicago and what you hope to accomplish. Uh, well, Chicago has a very vibrant and active Palestinian uh, American community, and they are leading in the organizing, but there are over 100, if I'm not mistaken, maybe 150 organizations that are part of this effort to march on the DNC, uh, right. what it's called. And it's part right. of this effort to keep the pressure up, uh, largely platforming Gaza and, and, and the genocide. But there's also so much more, so much other discontent with the Democratic Party. Uh, but this is, you know, hearkening back to 1968 and the anti-Vietnam War protests. And of course, the unrest that we saw at the DNC in Chicago in 1968, just as many kind of people and energy is expected next week at the 2024 DNC outside. So there is a program if people are not uh, hooked in and would like to join, you can look up the website is like March on the DNC. And, and then they have the schedule of, of programs. There is a big march on the 19th, the day that the, the DNC convention opens. And then throughout uh, through the 22nd, it ends on the 22nd. That's what's going to be happening outside. And again, Palestinian American organizers have been at the forefront of that effort but uh, it's a, a, a huge, huge coalition. Uh, and that is the building of this coalition. You know, certainly there's more coalesced around just the horror of Gaza, but it's also been uh, a couple decades and even more of work done by Palestinian Arab Americans and others concerned about Palestinian liberation struggle in building alliances and in recognizing that uh, you know, we are stronger together and generally the forces that a profit or benefit off of our oppression are the same that are oppressing other communities in other areas. And so that building of these uh, networks and solidarity and allies is work that has been ongoing, but has been elevated in this time just over the, the horror of Gaza. And then you, ha you will have inside the DNC um, the uncommitted delegates, uh, many of them who are Palestinian or, or Arab American. And, and also we have some Palestinian and Arab American uh, Biden delegates who will be inside trying to talk to other delegates and use just that position of, of being a delegate there to, to raise the pressure on the, the um, Democratic Party as a whole, but certainly on the, the Kamala Harris campaign. Of, of signaling and, and moving towards a change in policy. And so that's what the, the delegates who care about Palestine have been working on. The uncommitted delegates have had not another bomb campaign. And if people listening in would like to look it up, if you look up not another bomb, the uncommitted campaign has been having weekly uh, calls explaining to other delegates and other interested people how to get involved in the Not Another Bomb campaign, which is uh, an integral part of the uncommitted strategy uh, of widening the circle. So it's not just us 30 delegates who are there, nor the 30 delegates and the, the 700 plus thousand who voted uncommitted, but also continuing to bring more people into the movement to increase the pressure. So next week should be very dynamic. On, it, it's also going to be tough. I, I, I have to admit, I am one part energized, but another part knowing that we're going into this, at least into the convention, into this area and environment where they have been working heavily to to talk up Kamala Harris and to generate all this excitement for her and to show the unity of the party. So right. they really want to show unity and that is going to be on full display. 
uh, next week, I am sure, even before when uh, it was when Biden announced he was going to step down, all the Democratic Party in, in almost every state gathered their delegation and tried to get unanimous uh, endorsement of of Kamala Harris, the Michigan delegation, the uncommitted delegates spoke up, but sadly, you know, it was, um, the voices were marginalized. I mean, you heard it, the delegates talking about the importance of stopping the slaughter on our families. And it was like, yeah, 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 let's unanimously approve Kamala Harris and vote to endorse her. And uh, some of you might've seen one of our delegates as he was speaking, another delegate unmuted to say, shut up, and then a profanity, uh, which is really uncalled for. But it is part of, and this is not to denigrate all, you know, the Democratic Party or anything, but just this effort to just show complete unity and that we're all behind Kamala and to try to marginalize us. But we, we it's up to us to show that we're not going to be marginalized. We're not a marginal voice in this, um, in this party and in this country who want to see a ceasefire and who don't want to fund uh, the bombs that are decapitating children. You uh, referred to this briefly. I want you to say more, uh, uh, Boyda, about uh, it, it, this past winter and spring, we found hope in the voices of young people, particularly the students on uh, hundreds of college and university campuses uh, all around the country. Um, and of course, then summer break came. And are, are you hearing, I mean, are you are you feeling and hearing contacts around the country that there'll be a revival of these encampments and student demands picking up again this fall? I, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I I'm going to speak specifically about Michigan. Yes, I do believe that the students are in contact. Um, you have the National Students for Justice in Palestine and the various organizations that they work with that have not stopped throughout the summer, but their work has not been focused on, on the college campuses because they're, they're sparse or they're empty right now, but they have been in mobilizing national demonstrations against the slaughter and against when Netanyahu came. National Students for Justice in Palestine and the Palestinian Youth Movement and allies were key organizers in that. So the activity uh, has not stopped. In Michigan, and I'm going to focus specifically here because I'm, it's one of the things that I have been uh, very busy with, uh, last month the students approached me with uh, a request if I would run for regent in the um, you know, the elections every every two years in Michigan, two seats for university regents, the three uh, universities in Michigan, University of Michigan, Michigan State, and Wayne State University, every two years, two seats are up for election. And they came to me with this plan to actually seat a regent who would listen to them because the Board of Regents at the University of Michigan, which is my alma mater, has been, uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep it kind, has been really disappointing in, in how they treated the students. The students' demand was for a meeting, which is not you know, some big demand. We want the regents to meet with us and to listen to us. And they were not only ignored, but vilified, uh, called anti-Semitic by regents and mocked by other regents. Wow. On top of that, you have students who are being now put through a disciplinary process that goes against the University of Michigan's own policies, because I'm representing one of these students as an, as an attorney. And the University of Michigan has its code of conduct, which they call the Statements of Rights and Responsibilities, and they have it outlining how the process is supposed to go. The university violated so many of them and on top of violating them in order to go after these students last month in contravention of their own policies of how you can amend the policies they went and amended the policies to make them more um to strip really students of their rights and make this so kind of uh, authoritarian and very punitive this whole process uh so and this is coming largely from the regent so it, it does need to change. 
the regents in representing and in their position of leadership, what is leadership? Leadership is showing kind of um, the ability to listen and the ability to do what's best for the people who you represent or who you work for. And these regions, unfortunately, uh, have not done so. And so I was heartened by these students, not only because of the, the encampment and what they were able to do and accomplish at the University of Michigan, uh, to you know, their own detriment, I said some are being put through disciplinary process. Some, not only students, but faculty are also being prosecuted. So there has been a, a lot of that. They put themselves on the line uh, in order to stand up for what's right. And then they move that into not, not just protesting, but let's mm -hmm. also organize politically within the electoral system. And even though the Democratic Party has not been kind to us, they knew that, you know what, if we have more members than they do, then we can vote, we can vote our people in or vote the resolutions we want. And so when I agreed to stand for this position, they in two days, they registered over 2000 2, new members. Oh, wow. And they will be over 2000 new members. And now they're working working to mobilize them to come to the Michigan Democratic Party Convention, which is on the 24th of August, which is when my um, election will be to see if I am the nominee of the Democratic National, uh, the Michigan Democratic Party. But that kind of, you know, knowing we are protesting and pushing from the outside, but there are ways to push also from the inside and certainly being involved. Uh, it takes being involved in order to be able to do that. So I am um, I am blown away by these students, how fast they mobilize, how organized they are. I, I mean, I call myself an organizer, but I do not, I mean, I do not stack up to them at all in all my years. So it's, uh, that's what's happening in Michigan and they do have plans to continue. I don't know exactly what the strategy is, but I would uh, bet that it's the same across the country. Well, wait, uh, I'm aware of the time and I've got three, I have three, questions that I want to sneak in here before we we wrap things up. So I'm going to ask you to be economical with, with your replies so I can get the two questions in from the chat as well as then my last question for you. Okay. So uh, from from uh, uh, the chat room, given that, given that I'll be giving a lecture to other students such as myself about Palestine and having conservative family members what is a good way to deal with people who are unaware of the history of Palestine or disagree with the genocide position, given the long history of Israeli occupation, and for people who really don't know or care much about Palestinian history? In other words, how do you talk to yeah. conservative friends and family members and others who don't, who, who don't, who by default don't accept your position? How do you begin the conversation? Yeah, I mean, it. It depends on the situation you're in, but I, I personally feel like it's always good to find how you can relate to the person. You can usually find some way to, to something in common that you can relate to and and bring this up. If it starts with a disagreement, I mean, is the person open to learning also? Because a lot of the position that is that may be anti-Palestinian or pro-Israel is based on the misinformation that we have been fed for decades. And one thing about uh, the Palestinian liberation struggle is there is a lot of information out there from uh, books and podcasts and and documentaries and movies. So there are a lot of resources. But if the person in front of you who you're talking to is willing to listen, then I would suggest some of those resources. Uh, in addition to you know the human rights uh, reports, etc. There's there's no uh, shortage of resources. And even though there are criticisms to this approach. If it works with the person who you're talking to, to refer them to Israeli sources, because maybe they're more trusted or less biased as they think, then do so. You can start with, uh, you mentioned uh, Professor Elan Pape at the beginning, at the introduction of this, uh, who has a couple of wonderful books and just uh, published a new one on the uh, Israeli lobby, but has a couple of wonderful books, one of them being The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine uh, and others. You can have Israeli human rights organizations. Again, Palestinian sources 
are no less credible and even more because we, we're living it. But if people want to believe Israelis is more, if that's where you're starting from, there's a lot of resources and I would suggest go there. But maybe first start with trying to relate to the person on some level and bringing it to the human level, human stories, I find works. And then from uh, uh, an, another uh, Palestinian American activist, uh, you may know uh, him in Washington, D.C., Philip Farah. He, he asks, a number of activist groups are trying to come up with a strategy for the movement for a free Palestine to allow a greater collaboration around, among our largely fragmented movement. For example, the Palestinian youth movement, mask off mask campaign seems like part of the strategy to target commercial and industrial interests that are feeling Israel's genocide. Any thoughts on this? I think that's probably a, a larger uh, discussion of strategy, which I don't think I can, you know, answer in a minute. But I, you know, the I think you were talking about Maersk, their campaign against Maersk. Maersk yeah, Maersk. Which, uh, yeah, Maersk, uh -huh. yeah. Maersk, Maersk. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, I, I think it's great. There's also a campaign that um, I part of the Freedom Flotilla Coalition that's been working to break the siege on Gaza, but we just teamed up with No Harbor for Genocide, the attempt to stop the uh, import uh, of fuel, jet fuel to Israel. We uh, we know that there are um, United States liner of, um, of fuel from Valero that's heading to Israel right now with a shipment of jet fuel. But these kinds of actions, um, sometimes I think we think that in movements, you know, we need to be all allied and all think the same. That's almost impossible. Uh, it's important, I think, that we uh, ally and join forces on some things like the big marches on Washington. You've seen hundreds of organizations come together to co-sponsor that. And, and we've seen hundreds of thousands turn out. But then you also see other campaigns that suits the, the region or the organization. And, and that's fine too. And if we might not agree on something, a particular campaign, that's fine. I wouldn't say we are disconnected. We know what we are working for. And uh, as long as we can ally, I think, on, on some of the big things, which I believe has been happening, some of the other things we don't always have to see eye to eye. And it's actually good to see all of these different cam campaigns in different places that, um, that are doing their thing to contribute to the pressure. Now, if it, there might be conflict, that's a whole other thing, but I haven't seen really anything really big. And a lot of people coming back to different ways to implement this uh, isolation of Israel, right? Boycott, divestment, sanctions, that's what the student movements call for, divestment. You have this um, campaign against Mears to, to block or to, you know, to also divest from these companies that are profiting from from Israel's actions and the No Harbor for Genocides actually working on direct action to try to block these shipments. All of that, um, like I said, different strategies working together to isolate Israel, put the pressure on to create the, the necessary pressure that will make Israel end the occupation and the genocide. Because this, again, going back to one of my first comments, this idea that the only way is through negotiations no, that is not the only way. That is not even a way because you uh, you cannot negotiate with an entity that wants to get rid of you. You just can't do that. You have to mobilize the enough pressure to make it very costly for that entity to continue doing or impossible to continue doing what it's doing. And that's what I think the various organizations and the movement as a whole is working on. So Hawaida, uh, in your parting words to us, uh, just like we did in February and March, uh, as I mentioned, many of us are heading to Washington, D.C. Uh, what would your message be as we approach our Congress people? Some supportive, some not so supportive. But uh, uh, what should be our asks as we meet with our representatives? Oh, gosh. there. I think one of the ones... You know, I find that a lot of the American people might not care about international law, which we cite a lot, but we have to know also that the uh, the actions of the administration is also violating U.S. law. And I, I would stress to the people that that message might, you know, break through, that maybe we, we try that. So what we are asking for is that we enforce U.S. law, 
And if we enforce U.S. law, we would not be seeing all of these shipments of arms to Israel. So that is one thing I think that would be good to focus on. Uh, I'm sure the activists who are here have those uh, resources. Another kind of a little bit broader message, again, goes back to this idea that we cannot go back to um, th this situation where Palestinians, again, are being called on to to negotiate for their freedom. And we hear that coming up again about the two-state solution, the two-state solution. I, I would say we don't want to get into that. We want to focus on a solution that will guarantee the equal rights of everyone. And this attempt to do a two-state solution for over 30 years has failed. So why don't we work on a solution where every, we're working on respecting the dignity and the equality of every single person. And right now, it is the Palestinians who have no freedom are being deliberately denied the right to dignity. Although I would say that Palestinians are, you know, show the world dignity because everything that they are going through and they have not lost their humanity. They have not lost their ability to, to love and to love life, despite the fact that life has not shown them any kind of, of kindness. But I would veer away from any talk about two-state solution. Israel has already made that uh, impossible. We're looking at implementing the law, U.S. law. And part of U.S. law is making sure that our weapons not only don't, uh, that don't violate international human rights, humanitarian law, and the uh, International Court of Justice in its July ruling. Sorry, last thing. I know I'm, I'm long-winded. I'm sorry. People yeah. call it an advice opinion and technically it's an advisory opinion but it's only an advisory opinion meaning that there um it wasn't a contentious case it wasn't like israel versus you know south africa or something right. like that it was it was a request to the highest court to interpret the law and we do that in the united states all the time like in the in in a lower court when we the judge doesn't know how to rule on a certain point because he doesn't know the state of certain law you'll certify that question to a higher court. And this is what the UN did in this situation, certified questions to the highest court to interpret the state of the law. And so that decision, I would encourage everyone to read it because it is, it is monumental and it reinforces everything that we have been saying. And, and that is the state of the law. So don't let anyone say, well, it's only advisory. It's not, uh, it's not mandatory. Uh, it, it is the state of the law. And when it says states have an obligation to do this, that's what international law says. So all of that being when you're, uh, I just said two contradictory things, but it's two things that you can bring, U.S. law, but also we don't want to be seen as consistently and constantly violating international law as it, that does nothing to enhance U.S. credibility and U.S. standing around the world. And really arguably, and even I think definitively, the United States has really lowered its credibility and standing in the international community. And that's any of us want. So those are just a few points that you might keep in mind as uh, as you head to Washington. And maybe I'll be there with you. Thank you for all of that work. Uh, it is necessary. I know um, we may be tired. It's been unrelenting. Uh, but, but just imagine how tired Palestinians are and they are depending on us, really. So please don't, uh, please don't give up. I think what we're doing is working. Oh, I did. It's always good to spend time with you. Thank you.